I have, through dreaming and waking up, lived thousands of different lifetimes. There are fundamental metaphors about reality, waking up from a dream. We have this cognitive experience of shifting between realities. There's another world behind this world. Okay, so this is gonna set the tenor for everything. We are living in a computer programmed reality. Simulation theory is the idea that this is all fake. The Matrix was real. We are being inhabited by some sort of player. I would start giving myself tests. I'm thinking of someone and I turn the corner and there they are. The only clue we have is when some alteration in our reality occurs. We are living in a simulation. Okay, so what do I do with that? I don't know. Enjoy it. Simulation theory is a blending of religion and science. This is a way to deal with the complexity of human existence. What's the point of laws? What's the point of all this? This is what it feels like to be alive right now. The inability to separate real world from digital reality. A world without rules, controls, people are scarcely real to me. Because it's a game. There's a lot of very dark forces on the horizon. There are things that are trying to manipulate me. This world is capable of falling apart. Somebody's got to be putting their hand on the scale. The creator of the game. Good, thank you. Nice to meet you. In here. Um, I th I remember. I think I th it was I was uh you. I became aware of you and your work uh at the New York Film Festival when room two thirty seven. You did one one uh, Q and A at the Film Center. Do you remember that at the? Uh, I, I, I I I do. That was a that that, that was an amazing time. Yeah, it was great. And it was a great conversation afterwards. I remember enjoying that very much. So I've been uh, following your your film since. So it's great. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Um, um, that film, for anybody who hasn't seen it, is, is uh, kind of uh, looks at The Shining, right? And, and takes a sort of uh, looks into all the sim symbol sim uh, the uh, symbolism therein and the people who and the, and the people who have discovered it <laughs> very much right of course and um and then the nightmare which was uh also kind of a, another look at uh, like a, an interesting perspective of sleep paralysis through those who have lived through it or do live through it experience it right and now finally we're at um <clears throat> your new film a glitch in the in the matrix which what, does feel uh, like the end of that cycle in a way. Does it? <laughs> it does. How do you see how do you see the pattern there? Since we're talking well, since you're interested well, yeah. in patterns. Well, I mean it's interesting because it isn't as if this happened by design, but you know, in hindsight, to me it feels like, you know, they're all very similar in in subject and in focus, that um, it's just sort of a widening of the lens if they're all about people, I think, struggling struggling to understand mysteries that the first one, you know, it's a particular film, but it would, I think it would have been a very similar movie if they were trying to understand a painting or a song or a book. Um, you know, the second one is about the subconscious and the supernatural, um, you know, mystery of dream states. And then, you know, this one is about <laughs> the nature of reality itself. Some sort of collective dream state in a way. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Dude. Are you interested in the, I'm, what I don't, I guess what I'm trying to work out here is as, a, as, as you, the narrator, which is you, if you are 
supporting these ideas. I mean, you're presenting them and you take them. And I, what I appreciate is you also, uh, your subjects are not, um, you don't make, you know, you, 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 you give them a, um, you're a very respectful platform and in all th these films, you know, um, whereas I'm, you know, like the way QAnon, for instance, is, is, is presented is invariably as a bunch of loons, but you're missing by presenting them as such. And I'm getting back to your films in a moment, but as doing that, you don't take the broader picture into account, right? We, we miss that, which is really the important part. So I'm wondering, are you trying to uh, tease that out of your, of the films? Like, okay, because obviously folks like Phil Dick and others actually really do believe that we are living in this, um, uh, we're not living in the reality, that we're living in um, an alternative uh, or simulation of reality. Uh, so is that something people need to believe or are we all supposed to kind of think about that as a possibility for real? Well, I mean, I think there's two ways of thinking about simulation theory and, you know, knock on wood, I would love it if when the discussion continues beyond the film that they would look, they would consider it both ways that there's the literal idea, you know, that scientifically speaking, we are actually inside of a giant computer somewhere um, that is a simulation of, of organic life and that with the right tools, you know, with the right um, sort of measurements, we could break this all down into zeros and ones. Um, and if you get, into, and, and there is a, there is a there there, if you start to pour over the science and, you know, you read up on Bostrom and Neil deGrasse Tyson and a handful of others who've gone down that hole, it's a, it's a you know, it's kind of a fascinating question. Um, but for me, I'm even more interested in, and I think the movie arguably is more interested in, you know, simulation theory as a metaphor, you know, talking about the way each of us construct reality based on our histories, our biases, our media diet, our peer group, you know, and what it means for, you know, there to be how many billion bubbles or how many of us are living in, in shared realities. And, you know, what we lose by being stuck in individual ones. I think you get the closest to that way of looking at it. Uh, your film, again, we mentioned this really quickly, but it, it we, we are, uh, there are four or five subjects in Glitch in the Matrix. How many? Well, there, there are four of those characters, you know, who are handled with avatars. The witnesses or the avatars. The witnesses. Right, right. And then there's, you know, I think there's four, Experts, um, Bostrom, Eric Davis, um, Emily Pottis, and um, I, I suppose Chris Ware, even though he's kind of coming at it from a different way. And then there's, you know, the I am an NPC Reddit user. And right, finally, right, right, right. Sure. And then finally, Josh Cook, who come, who's sort of his own category, who calls him by phone. Well, yeah. So getting to Josh, for instance, I mean, that seems like the closest we come because maybe this extreme situation is ex being an extreme example. Um, whereas it went, <clears throat> uh, it was a, there was a tragic story there. Uh, but here we get an example of somebody who maybe we're getting to the larger picture of why you know what you're getting at as far as like the people needing to believe in this idea of us of, that we're in a simulation for some broader internal psychological need or curiosity or something yeah, yeah and, and people get there you know different ways certainly you know i see no end of simulation theory jokes you know in social media every time something strange happens in the news which seems to be more and more and, and, and more frequently. Though, I mean, back to, I think where, where, where this question started, I think those four guys who are um, represented by the avatars are sort of the focus of the movie, 
right you know, sort, of, sort of sort of the main character so that with other people coming in for color commentary and then josh getting that one uh, big solo moment we should say you partnered with an animation company right that did a, a digital animated caricature avatar rather for each of your these four guys yeah i mean it was a amazing it was a, it was a very small number of people though i think they were able to you know really really um work miracles for this thing that um my friends at Mindbomb Films, which um, founded by my my pal Sid Garrett, who I've been working with since the 20th century, you know, sort of took the lead in the animation stuff. Mm -hmm. but, um, and the avatars were were designed by this comic book artist, Chris Burnham, who's both an amazing pop storyteller, but as you can see, he's got a real flair for design. And Lorenzo Fonda took the lead on animating those avatars. Um, and putting them into those grid worlds with um, Davy Force, who you might remember him from, he and his friend Nick did that shining, um, that sort of LSD drenched shining fried chicken commercial um, short, the chickening a couple of yes. years ago. Yeah, well, I remember that, reading about it in your, yeah, in the notes. Yeah. Oh, you haven't seen it? No, I haven't seen oh, it. You, you, you can find it online. You, it'll blow your mind. Um, I, I'll, maybe I'll add it to the uh, the end here. <laughs> I'm yeah. going to put in the trailer for the glitch in the matrix at the beginning of our conversation. Before our conversation, maybe we'll add the chickening to the end. Yeah, no, the chicken the, the chickening makes two three seven look like a Alex Gibson movie. Um, but he did the. He came in to do the more photo real stuff, like the guy in the movie theater and the spaceship sequence, uh -huh. uh, all the stuff that we kind of considered outside of the simulation or the simulation machines, the brain in the vat, the giant sphere. Yeah, it's a it's a susceptibly high tech movie. Um, yeah, and I think you know, and a lot of it's just because I guess where we are in technology, right? Like a lot of the software that we were using are things that were just now hitting the point where you know it was affordable on the the budget and schedule of a of an indie doc because mm -hmm. like Lorenzo you know was animating the avatars you know through motion capture right he we got one of those rubber suits like they had in Lord of the Rings yeah and he would watch you know the performances of the real people and then mimic them and add a little bit of flair um, for visual communication. And you know, with what he did with his arms and body language, would then be mapped onto um, on the avatars. And there was this company, Rococo, who's just like released a beta of that as we went into production. In fact, you know, we had been waiting for we, there, there were breakthroughs that we were waiting for that never quite came, like gloves and um, facial recognition. So wow. since the, the gloves weren't ready, that you know, we had to animate the, the hands. Um, on their own separately. I but see. Wow. The, the, the greater body language happened through uh, motion capture, which, I mean, the fact that a teeny movie like this is able to use that sort of Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, that technology is. Um, yeah, well, it, no pun intended, it, it does illustrate how quickly technology, not only how quickly it's, it's becoming more and more sophisticated, but also more available and accessible, right? Yeah, well, yeah. And, and, and weirdly, um, Magnolia just did this thing on Instagram where they have the avatars as filters, so that oh wow, yeah, that you can you can you can actually communicate in an Instagram video as those characters, but in your like you can exactly do what we did in the movie, but you know in real time on anybody's phone, it's just. It's just nuts that the technology is, has, has moved that fast. Well, therefore, people should share uh, the film. And t if you've seen it, tell everybody you know about it so you can have those types of online experiences together. Yeah, Since well, we're living almost entirely online anyway. Well, and, and it happened, you know, at the at Sundance this year, right? You know, we have a, a virtual premiere, which you know, it was unfortunate for 99% of the films that they showed, but, you know, for us, it was kind of on Kind of fitting, right? Yeah, well, and the crazy, one of the, you know, one of the other crazy thing is that yeah. they, they had their party 
there in like it's Sunday that's his famous oh yes party. yeah yeah and yeah. the party was in virtual reality right and, and you so, adopt an avatar when you're as a uh, participant right exactly and you put on the oculus yeah. and then you're in this round um lounge that is literally floating above the earth and you were able to have a party with you know maybe nine members of the cast and crew and friends and people from other films and audience members right and, you know, I was in there for two and a half hours and it felt like I went to a place and hung out with my friends. Mm. And, you know, we were living the movie. It was you know, bananas. Um, going through the, 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 the um, one of the sort of the, the linchpins of the film is this 1977 uh, presentation um, made by Philip K. Dick, right? Um, in Metz, France. Uh, where the audience, where which is so great because it's such a an amazing piece of footage uh, on so many levels. But it, uh, you, you know, you you look at the audience and you can't really tell. I mean, they were captivated. That you can tell. Can't really tell because he's explaining th this idea probably to people who are hearing it for the very first time in their lives. Had to be a mind blowing concept for many people in the audience, right? Yeah. Well, especially. I mean, to me, I think it would be an easier sell to say that we were in a dream or like right. some, some other kind of metaphor for this world not being quite real. Because 1977, what do computers look like? You know, filing cabinets with gigantic magnetic reels and blinking lights and maybe Pong. But you know, so, so to see the possibility that they could create- Well, we had Kubrick. Stimulation. Yeah, is and how is is so is is prophecy, you know. When we were at the VR party, you know, af after the film, wearing the Oculuses, mm -hmm. well, you can see a perfect simulated world from there. It's not that far in the. It's just a better version of what we were doing, but there was no comparison in the seventies, you know. Right, so, right, yeah, yeah. So that's that was that was really really unbelievable to see that and to see him talking about it that long ago um you know the audience is amazing they don't look like they're <laughs> look they're that, that like they're not on board it's kind of a, a, amazing to see them uh i imagine this is a very a, the, these types of simulations seem especially appealing in recent days um anyway because um the reality that we're quote unquote reality we're living in is is been pretty awful. Yeah, well, it certainly is. So the way. timing of the film is been, is actually kind of interesting. Yeah, and I thought I was I thought that I was very much behind the curve based on when we got going, but it seems to um, you yeah, know our time our time seems to feel pretty good, and and I know that feeling that you're talking about, and I think that goes back to you know a lot of the jokes that I see about it. Um, well, the simulation is acting up again, or here's another glitch, or here's another piece of proof that, you know, in some ways you can blow off a little steam by saying, I guess it doesn't matter that much since we're only <laughs> in simulation and can, mm -hmm. and can feel a little better about it. <laughs> um, did you grow up uh, reading Philip K. Dick, or was this something that you more recently came to? Uh, a in, in, as a yeah, I, I knew him most. I knew him mostly through the movies. Right. You know, I read. You know, um, you know, Electronic Sheep. You know, after I saw Blade Runner, and a couple of the short stories. But it wasn't really into the in, until we. I started thinking about the film and realizing that he was a um, a good touchstone. That I started pouring through book after book after book. Oh yeah. You know, so um, it, it it was something that has the deep dive, you know, into, into his work has, has, has been much more recent. Um, well, uh, Ronnie Asher is the director of uh, his latest, it's only your third documentary. I was, I was sort of shocked. It's called, the, uh, let me finish my thought for once, A Glitch in the Matrix. Uh, and it's uh, going to be, uh, it's already, it's available now. We're a little late to the, to the, to the game here, but we're, uh, the, the film is currently available uh, virtually, of course. Of course, right. And on demand. Probably yeah. very easy to find. 
Um, yeah, you know, it's on all the major digital platforms and in some places, theaters, I'm not sure, uh, certainly not out here, but maybe it's safer in other parts of the country. It's, it's, it, yeah, and, uh, it's go, it's, there are theaters actually screening films elsewhere in the country. You're in, you're in Northern Los Angeles, is that what I'm? Um, yeah, Northeast LA. Northeast LA, okay. And I'm north of New York City at the moment. Okay. Hiding away my own, in my own fashion, I guess. Right. Um, so I was, this is your, just, I, I was shocked when I looked back that Room 237 was really just your, was that your first feature? It was, but you know, I probably spent, I don't, I don't know if I want to count it, but at least 20 years making shorts and music okay. videos and doing graphics and being an editor and, you know, I see. Um, being a film, being an editing teacher. Um, okay. I had, I had an attempted, I had attempted a, doc, a feature doc before that, turned into a couple of shorts. So, um, you know, I've been beating my head against the wall for for years before I managed to uh, get that one together. Well, and you discovered sort of, sort of this niche that you're, where you have a lot lot to kind of express, um, right? Because it seems like maybe about seven years since all three films have come out now. So that's pretty well, prolific. Um, yeah, well, I'm trying to, I guess, make up for lost time, right? Mm. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, again, it's called the glitch in the matrix. And uh, um, do you recommend people have see any of these touchstones like the matrix films? It makes well, sense, right? You'd probably be familiar with those. It does. I mean, I can't imagine who hasn't seen the matrix at this point. But, yeah. You know, I'd also recommend total recall and existence. Um, you know, maybe afterwards check out rolled on a wire, which is a unbelievable mini series again, made in the seventies. 70s or 80s, the Fastbinder one. It's like a two-part, oh. four-hour. Um, it's and it's it's a it's an adaptation of the same book that inspired the 13th Floor. And in some ways, it's one of the more interesting uh, simulated simulated world movies. I wonder is is that just like on YouTube or something or? No, it's on uh, Fastbinder. What? Cr Criterion put out a beautiful. Oh, Criterion has it. Just on the Criterion. Criterion. And I believe it's streaming on their service. Criterion Channel. Certainly, they have. Certainly, they have. They put it out on blue. Um, highly recommended. I'm gonna. I have not seen that one, so I'm. I'm excited to see that. Anyway, well, congratulations, and um, I'm really uh, thrilled to that we finally were able to work this out. Um, been wanting to talk to you for a long time. Oh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. glad you did. Thanks for reaching out, Adam. Yeah, my pleasure. Oh, we'll do it again. I hope so. Okay. Okay. Have a great weekend. You too. Take Thanks, care. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. Oh, somebody's Bye. in the background. Oh, yes, it's me. Who, Tina? Yeah. Oh, nice to hear your voice, if nothing else. <laughs> Have a good weekend, guys. Bye. Okay. Take care. Thanks a lot, Tina. Bye. Welcome to Char Bay's Chicken World and Restaurant Resort. This is the largest fast food entertainment complex in North America with a subterranean farm, a power plant, and the world's only magma heated chicken blast fryer. Now, you be the new senior chief night manager. Now, does that sound like what you're looking for? Well, that sounds fine to me. Yeah, you call this a sandwich? Yeah, I know. Tastes like shit. What about Tony? What about me? Get back in the kitchen and make me a real sandwich before I give you a crack in the mouth. Maybe straighten out your eyes. <laughs> Johnny! <laughs>
Charmaine's Chicken World and Restaurant Resort is going completely insane. <laughs> Never tried Charmaine's. You've got a big surprise coming to you. <laughs> Introducing our new and amazingly tasty volcanically activated extreme dipping sauce, the shiny. shiny. They'll love it. Charmaine's Chicken World and Restaurant Resort with over 237 attractions in Mount Spalsy on Highway 272. We'll blindfold the chickens with a tiny little band-aids, and then we just drown them in the spicy barbecue sauce and pluck all the tail feathers with a shop vac and a pair of surgical clamps. Do you mind if I ask why you do that? Alfonso, do you mind just keeping it down a bit? The big people are talking here. And other than that, no other problems. Oh, except the toilets sometimes receive volcanic pressure blasts that explode feces all over the walls of the bathroom, I'm afraid. pressure tank is located in room 237. So as we gotta go into room 237 and take out the volcano sauce pressure tank. Room 237? Yeah, room 237. 237. Am I not speaking clearly? You just gotta go in there and distract that big crazy chicken so me and Tony can plant the explosive. Who's Tony? Who the fuck am I? Who the fuck are you, you green ass piece of shit? Torrance, hello! How are you? Okay, would you like to try the new experimental sauce, the shiny volcano sauce? I'm awfully glad you asked me that, Lloyd. Well done, okay, listen up. We have a spicy, a super spicy, tasty spicy. We have a super shiny spicy, and we have a super duper shiny spicy suicide sauce! Hey! It has the essence of a real natural <laughs> volcano right into the inside of the red drum! Sorry, I meant burger. I'm dyslexic, didn't I tell ya? <laughs> okay, check. <laughs> Ever since we've moved here, you've been acting more and more like a chicken. There's too much pressure. The volcano sauce pipes is gonna blow. Chip, 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 chip.